of a democracy uh, is tied uh, uh, heavily to the quality of knowledgeable and committed uh, uh, citizenry. The, the health of this country depends on a knowledgeable uh, democracy. That's you. You are the key for that, and I'm grateful uh, for, this, for this chance. Um, one of the things uh, about this topic is that it's very dense. And um, when I first joined the Foreign Service uh, a long time ago, our biggest challenge was getting more information, constantly getting more information. So if, if something went wrong, can we clarify, can we, uh, can we identify uh, whether our allies are uh, of a similar mind, whether uh, our adversaries are of a, of a different uh, bent. Um, by the time I uh, left government, uh, three years ago, we had an indigestion of information. <laughs> we had more detail, more data than you could shake a stick at, but we had less knowledge. And so the challenge of contemporary society, I think, is increasingly how to go from data to knowledge. We all get 10 second sound bites, we all get three inch uh, headlines. Uh, telling us what to think and, and when to worry, um, but we don't get the tools to examine the material ourselves and use uh, our, our own faculties to, um, to determine whether or not some soundbite is, um, is a genuine uh, concern, whether it's just shrieking in the dark. Uh, so how to get from data to knowledge is, um, is, a, is a big factor. Um, uh, these days. What I'm going to do in the course of this uh, uh, discussion is throw out a lot of numbers, there's a, there's a lot of data. I want you to kind of let that wash over you. I use the numbers as a brush to paint a picture. It is the factors that I'm identifying through uh, uh, the use of these numbers that I'd like you to keep in mind. That will stay forever. The, the individual numbers will change all the time. How we consume uh, energy, what we consume, and, and the like will, will change. Um, so a, a quick word on the scope of the issue. Every day, every day, this planet consumes 89 million barrels of oil. The United States is the single largest consumer uh, we consume roughly 19 million barrels of oil a day. We are a prominent uh, supplier of the world's oil, but we consume all that we produce, and we are obliged to import more. When I say obliged to import more, we, uh, we consume 19 million barrels a day. We only produce 10 million barrels a day. So we are obliged to import nine plus million barrels a day. More than 50% of our imports come from the Western Hemisphere. Overwhelmingly, that's Canada, Venezuela, more on Venezuela uh, uh, later, and Mexico. We get 19% of our imports from Africa, overwhelmingly Nigeria, Angola, Equatorial Guinea. And we get 18% of, uh, of our imported oils uh, from the Middle East, overwhelmingly Saudi Arabia. A quick word on the relative order of magnitude, and here I am not using energy and petroleum synonymously. Energy is a much larger umbrella uh, under which petroleum is subsumed. The average American, just to give you a sense of, uh, of the uh, order of magnitude, the average American consumes twice as much energy as the average Brit, six and a half times as much energy as the average Brazilian, and 21 times as much energy as the average Indian. I mentioned we are the world's largest importer of the world's oil. We import more than 9 million barrels a day. China is number two. They import 5 million barrels a day. So it's a 
bit of a gap between number one and two. Japan is third. They import uh, over four million barrels a day. They have absolutely no resources at all. World demand for energy is expected to grow by 44% over the next 20 years. Keep in mind 20. We're going to keep coming back to that next 20 years coming at us. 73% of that new demand is expected to come from the developing world, overwhelmingly China, India. But a close third is the Arab oil producing world itself. Why? They need to invest in their own infrastructure. They need to provide for the future of their country, their uh, next generations, because what has caught their attention is this thing called Arab unrest that is sweeping the region. That's a national security issue, so they are taking more and more of their product and their proceeds to invest in their own countries to try to bring along the next generations and not have the problems that they have seen flare up in the non-oil producing Arab world. I'm going to throw out a thesis. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship behind it. Uh, we don't have time to go into the scholarship, so I'm going to ask you to trust me. I know, from Washington, I'm asking you to trust me. I know, I know. But the thesis is, development is good. It is in everybody's interest on the planet that there be access to clean water, to reliable electricity, to roads, to health care, to schools, to jobs, opportunities to live, provide for the next generation, and, um, and uh, make a, a life possible for them. The contrary is also the case. It is not in the interest of the planet as a whole to have increasing numbers of failed or failing states, to have runaway poverty, to have disease, to have no hope. For every um, uh, um, incident in which people believe they have nothing left to lose, that's a losing proposition for the entire planet. Now here's where the, the scholarship link comes. Development good, but the more economies develop, the more the countries grow in their capability, the more energy they need, they must have. So there is no such thing when people talk about sustainable and you kind of reach a level that now we're okay and the planet can carry itself. That's not what we're talking about. The more there is growth, the more there is development, the more energy will be needed. So this is a growing issue. It doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't change. We can become lots more efficient, but we can't stop the growth of uh, energy consumption and expect to have energy, uh, expect to have economic development. So what are the global projections? By 2030, keep in mind that 20 year mark, we are expected as a planet to use 53% more coal than we use today, 42% more natural gas than we use today, 22% more oil than we use today, and oil remains remains the single largest fuel in the primary fuel mix of the planet in the year 2030 to 2035. Primary. So question, is there enough supply to meet this growth in demand that we're looking at? And mind you, we're looking at something that is a very short time frame. We're all going to see it talking about something that is, um, is certain in its projections for the next 20 years. Uh, what you will hear about and you see in, in the news is a, is a uh, debate called the peak oil debate. Peak oil is that point at which, if you're looking, if you're looking at a graph, uh, the, the peak oil uh, point is that point at which roughly 50% of your resources have been consumed. And at that point, you haven't run out of oil. It just gets harder, takes longer, becomes more expensive to extract the oil on the, um, on the other half of, of that uh, graph. The thing is, 
we don't know what the totality of the resources is. So it's really hard to calculate when you've consumed 50% of it. But you will hear in the debate, people will say, we passed peak last Thursday. Oh my God, we're running out of oil. It's only going to get more expensive. It's only going to be harder for us. Or you'll hear there's a finite amount of oil and they're running out of it in Saudi Arabia or the Chinese are drinking all of ours. Oh my God, right? That's a false debate. It, it, has, it has a premise to it that is, that is valid, and that is that this is a finite resource. We just don't know how big it is. And I'd like us to go over some of the factors that go into that analysis. And it's called the politics of petroleum for a reason. So one of the factors, big one, Technology. In the 1970s, the definition of full production of oil from any known oil field was 40%. That is to say, if you could extract 40% of all the oil in a known oil field, you were at full production. The quality and sophistication of our technology today has changed the definition change the definition of production. And today, the definition of production is 70%. So only after you have been able to extract 70% of all the oil in that known oil field, and we don't always know what a known oil field really holds, do you achieve the definition of full production. Technology keeps changing. In that sense, over the years, over the last 50 years, we have been running out of oil five times already, and we keep finding more. We keep finding more, we keep being able to access more. It doesn't necessarily mean there's more in the ground, but we can get at it. We can extract it. We can get it to market um, in, a, in a viable way. Another factor, not in my backyard, NIMBY. Everybody agrees we need more electricity. Everybody agrees we need more terminals. Everybody agrees we need more pipelines. Everybody agrees we need more refineries. Everybody agrees we need more, more energy. Just not in my backyard. I, um, I was born and raised in California, and uh, uh, we have beautiful uh, sunsets uh, on the beach there. It, it's actually pollution refracted through. Never mind. <laughs> so, so we have these beautiful romantic sunsets. You stand on the beach and you hold hands and you feel all lovey dovey and it's all mushy and things are great. And some politician comes along and says, you know, it's a beautiful horizon. Vote for me and I will make sure that nobody is going to build anything that mars that picture for 25 miles off the, off the coast. Some other politician comes along and he says, ha, vote for me and I will make sure nothing will be built for 50 miles off the coast. But there's this thing called curvature of the earth. <laughs> So if you stand on the beach and you look out, you can only see out 15 miles. <laughs> but there are politicians making good hay on this, and it's not just California. Huge fights in Florida. Huge fights elsewhere. It's, it's the politics of not in my backyard. It's a real thing. It keeps uh, things from being uh, permitted, sited, built, and, and operating. It's a real thing. There are, uh, and there are lots of them. There's a banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. <laughs> lots of these things. So, NIMBY. Another factor to take into account. Nature's whimsy. We have not yet restored the infrastructure in our um, states bordering the Gulf of Mexico 
to pre-Katrina levels, and how long has it been since Katrina hurricane? Now, we don't know when the next act of terror is going to take place. We don't know where it's going to be. We don't know how it's going to happen. But every year, we know we're going to have hurricanes. Hurricane season is June 1. We know when they have so many hurricanes, we give them names. We put them in alphabetical order. We're now at Debbie. So Mother Nature interrupting the flow of oil didn't affect whether or not it's in the ground. And it's not just hurricanes. It's not just uh, tsunamis and earthquakes off Indonesia. It's not just volcanoes uh, in Iceland, which then make it impossible to have a jet fly anywhere in Europe because there's so much ash in the air. But it's acts of nature, nature's whimsy. Oh, by the way, our infrastructure happens to be along the Gulf of Mexico. That's where our primary refineries, terminals, pipelines, and oh, by the way, our strategic petroleum reserve are all located. Why? See NIMBY above. Another factor, man's whimsy. Wars. Sanctions. We just put sanctions on Iran. We, uh, we uh, have uh, problems with respect to the uh, national policies of Venezuela. Uh, we look at um, uh, the um, hostage taking in Nigeria of uh, oil workers uh, and that effectively takes two million barrels of oil a day off the market. Didn't affect whether or not it's in the ground. Off the market. Market uh, changes, supply demand uh, changes, prices change. Um, civil unrest. Libya has gone into civil war. Another one and a half million uh, barrels of oil a day taken off the market. Uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia, seizing oil ships. Didn't affect whether or not it's in the ground. It's not about whether or not the earth has oil, but you can't move it. All of a sudden you've got all these other factors. National policies. Bangladesh thinks their, their natural gas is so precious they've decided to leave it in the ground. Didn't affect whether they had it, but they have decided as a matter of policy not to put it on the marketplace. The Arab oil producing world I mentioned earlier, rapidly using more of its own product to develop its own societies, that's product that isn't going onto the marketplace. It's not whether it's in the ground, but whether or not it moves. Is this a global commodity or not? What all, get, what all gets affected? The geoeconomic center of gravity. This is a big factor. I had mentioned earlier that 73% uh, of all the new demand growth expected in the world is going to come from the developing world, primarily China and India. If India does nothing today, its economy will grow at 8%. If it rains, 9%. And if there's a miracle, and India addresses any of its labor problems or its land reform issues, double-digit growth, and Katie bar the door. <laughs> there are today more Indians in the Indian middle class than the United States has people. And what do all these people want to do with their newfound status in life, their new middle class wealth in life? What do they want to do? They want to buy cars. <laughs> they want to buy cars. Those cars are going to run on gasoline. Those cars are going to run on roads. Now you're talking infrastructure. You're talking cement. You're talking heavy machinery. They're going to need fast food restaurants. They're going to need uh, spas. They've got places to go, people to see, things to do. Right? China has today tripled the number of cars on their highway in three years. They have got 25 million cars on the highway. They have promised their people 
They will have 100 million cars on Chinese highways by the year 2015. 100 million cars. Now China has a population of 1.3 billion people. The United States has just under 320 million people and we have over 240 million vehicles. So if you accept that some Americans are too young to drive, some Americans are too old or infirm to drive, then some of us must have more than one car. <laughs> and further, if you accept that even Americans, even Americans, cannot drive more than one car at a time, then if you are in the business of making cars or selling cars, are you going to focus on the saturated markets of the West? Or are you going to look to China and India where there is pent-up demand, growing ability to buy? Hence, China surpassed the United States two years ago as the number one market for automobiles. The geoeconomic center of gravity is shifting from West to East. Factoid. 81% 81, uh, 81 of all the heavy cranes in the world are in Shanghai. 14% of all the heavy cranes in the world are in Dubai. So did you just see where the center of gravity is shifting to? There is money to be made going out there, and a lot of folks have figured that out. Cartier has figured it out. The luxury market is in the East. Tiffany's has figured it out. They made more profit last year from their overseas sales, overwhelmingly China, than they have anywhere else. Caterpillar, the United States does heavy machinery. Their biggest uh, proceeds came from overseas sales last year, overwhelmingly Asia. It makes sense. You see the geoeconomic center of gravity shift. You see how energy is consumed. Yeah, it makes sense. Global economic health. In September of 2008, oil hit a peak and it cost $147 a barrel. <coughs> By Christmas of 2008, it had plummeted to $34 a barrel. In 2008, the world was consuming more oil than it had ever consumed before. They were at 86 million barrels a day. Remember I started out saying we are at 89 today, today. They were at 86 with the contraction, the economic contraction globally. The consumption of oil dropped globally to 82 million barrels a day. It didn't affect whether or not it was in the ground, but it may affect how much longer you have it in the ground if you're using less of it. But there's a flip side to that. If, if you use less and the price drops, then the incentive to invest in innovation and new technologies drops. If somebody says to you, I can make money so long as, with, with my new alternative fuel, so long as oil remains above $80 a barrel and you are buying it at $147 a barrel, you say, all right, let's, let's talk business. Let's see where this new technology, this new fuel can take us. But if the market has plummeted to $34 a barrel, then that new technology has become a burden and nobody is going to invest in it. And there are today plants that have never produced one kilowatt hour of electricity because it became too expensive suddenly. What we have now is an uneven global economic
economic recovery. Tell that to the Europeans and they say, what economic recovery? Say that to the Chinese and they say, what recession? And so the planet is no longer moving with one purpose. We are not all rowing in the same direction. And in some cases, at cross purposes. That means the way we use energy, the way we grow as economies changes. Human behavior changes in a, in a recession. I'm a, I'm a middle class kid from a middle class family in Los Angeles. My mother was a school teacher. Uh, my father was a, a municipal worker. And we had, and all my other little friends' families had the same things. We had one car. We had one TV. We had one telephone. <laughs> Wires. Extension cords. My mother wasn't deprived or denied. It simply never occurred to her to redo the kitchen. <laughs> now with the global recession, what are we looking at and change? human behavior. Instead of building McMansions at 5,000 square feet, we are looking at 2,300 square feet as the new normal for new housing. People are tightening their belts. They're looking for fewer rooms they don't use. That formal <laughs> dining room, right? So how we use space changes. How we plan our urban centers changes. How we plan mass transit changes. How we plan sewers and water treatment changes. As we tighten our belts, as we can try to consume less energy. These are all above ground factors. It's not about geology. It is the politics of petroleum. A concept, my guess is you haven't gone 24 hours without hearing this term, energy security. Turns out energy security means different things to different people. If you are a consumer, energy security means having reliable access to energy with a known or acceptable projection of cost. If, on the other hand, you are an energy producer, your focus is on markets. You want to make sure that you're not going to be stuck at the end of the day with a whole lot of goop that nobody wants. And we have experienced that as recently as within the last two decades where oil plummeted to less than $10 a barrel and kings, parliaments, and, and um, CEOs, and stockholders were aghast at what had happened. Not only were they not going to use the existing amount of oil, but they weren't investing in new technologies for innovation. The solution for both Consumer concerns for energy security and producer concerns for energy security lies for both of them in diversification. So if you are a consumer, you feel vulnerable. If somebody's got all your, all your um, uh, commodity needs and they can turn off the tap and you're stuck. So what do you do? You try to develop alternative sources alternative routes, so it's not just one hurricane that can throw you into a trap. You try to develop alternative materials and fuels. If you are a producer and you feel vulnerable that your best customer in the world, remember the United States consumes more than anybody else on the planet, your best customer says, we're addicted to foreign oil, we don't want to do it, you want to, you want to uh, pull it out of the ground, fine, we're not buying it. Then you as a producer would be stupid not to develop other markets. So when the Saudis develop major multi-billion dollar investments 
in Chinese terminals, refineries, and pipelines is so they can accept more Saudi product, of course. Because the solution for the panic for the producer is diversification of markets. If one market shuts you down, you still have someplace else to sell your wares. Just as for the consumer, if something goes wrong, maybe there's a, 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 a piracy um, uh, uh, act off the coast of Somalia, or there's a hurricane or something, at least you have alternative uh, sources of supply and routes uh, to rely on. Can we meet the world growth and energy demand without having it come at the expense of the American way of life? This is a key question for American planners, for foreign policy issues, for strategic planners. Is it a zero-sum game that we're dealing with? How is it possible for others to grow and develop in their economies without having it come at the expense of the American way of life. Is there a way to do that? Yes. Yes, there is. It's a three-pronged approach. It must be undertaken simultaneously, but it can be done. What are these three prongs? One, I don't mean to give them a number as if to imply uh, one is more important than the other. Uh, they are, they are three equally important uh, uh, concerns. Energy efficiency, the cheapest, most readily available energy to us today is that which we now waste. For every one unit of electricity that gets to its destination, we lose three as heat. So we need to have a smarter electricity grid a safer way of both storing electricity and transporting electricity, which means we're going to have to address some of these NIMBY issues. So, how to deal with greater efficiencies? And we're doing it, by the way. We're doing it even without Congress being able to address these issues. It's not that they won't. They've got close to 2,000 pages of the proposed legislation. They just haven't acted on it. Um, but it means that Americans are saying we want cleaner, more efficient operating fill in the blank refrigerators, cars, homes. We want tighter homes, more efficient homes. And the marketplace is responding. Today, you can't buy a new car that doesn't get at least 20 miles to the gallon. That wasn't true 10 years ago. So what, what has been dictated to the marketplace has come in part from the demand from the consumer. We are already more efficient today in the United States uh, than we have ever been. And we haven't changed our way of life and we're consuming less. It used to be we had to import more than 10 million barrels a day. Today we're down to nine plus. So it, it, is, it is in fact happening. Um, there is a difference, however. In Europe, they use their, uh, their imported energy for heat and electricity. In Asia, they use their imported energy uh, for industry. In the United States, we're good on, on, uh, on heat and, um, and industry, but we are out of control when it comes to the transportation sector. We are lousy on the highways. More than 70% of everything we import is used for vehicular travel. We are totally out of control on the highways. In March of 2009, American drivers spent $22 billion on gasoline. March of 2010, $31 billion. March of 2011, American drivers spent $42 billion on gasoline, and we're in a recession. <laughs> yep, the price of gas yeah, peaked. In, in 2008, it just, plummeted. Just last year, wasn't gas was, what, 340 yeah. No, no, but, but the oil, the oil ha hadn't changed. What has changed 
is how we refine it, how we distribute it, how we use it. Right now, it's plummeting, right? In fact, there's a glut. In fact, there's a glut. What we have last year is a U.S. Uh, expenditure of $1.1 trillion on energy, energy writ large, not just petroleum. So how we provide for our out-of-controlness on the highway is uh, A, to recognize we've got this problem, and B, to try to preserve as much as possible that petroleum necessary for transportation and improve our efficiencies and uh, provide alternative energies for the use of electricity. Are we doing that? Yes. And that gets to the second prong. The second prong of our three-pronged approach is expand the universe of available fuels. And here you can go uh, months talking about algae and wind and solar technologies, uh, all, all sorts of very exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. But the standard to be has got to be the cost of oil. Because if you can't beat that and it remains cheaper to use oil for your energy, then people will go back to it. So the standard to beat has to be oil. And that will continue for as far as the eye can see. People, uh, all projections take that into the second half of this century. We can talk about coal, we can talk about ethanol, um, um, but what I'd really like to spend a little bit of time on uh, in this discussion, because it's such a big deal, is shale, oil, and gas. You hear about it everywhere. I want us to spend a, a little bit of time on that. The, the other stuff is out there, and we can talk about that too. Uh, but I, I don't want to rob. Um, I don't want to take away from from time on on shale. Um, it's called the shale gale. It's that much of a game changer in the world of energy. It is global. There is shale all over the world. Shale is that rock in which. Oil and gas are trapped. What we talk about when we talk about conventional oil and conventional natural gas is we talk about that which is already flowing. So uh, I mentioned Equatorial Guinea off the, um, um, the west coast of Africa. Equatorial Guinea fancies itself to be the next Kuwait in the energy world. But their oil is several miles underwater. It will take decades of multi-billion dollars of investment to get at, extract, and put on the market that commodity. Kuwait, on the other hand, which Equatorial Guinea aspires to be, you can stick a soda straw on the ground, it'll come up sweet like crude. So the amount of effort to extract changes. Now, what is it about shale that is so different? And that's why it's called unconventional when you, when you see the, the debates in the, in the newspapers and so on. It is trapped in rock. In Canada, you hear about oil sand. That is oil that is trapped in sand. You don't really drill, you mine. You take the sands, you heat up something that's going to boil water, that's going to wash the sands, that's going to release the oil, that gets mixed with natural gas, create a floor, slurry to uh, put into a, a pipeline. It's more expensive. It's more expensive to extract. More expensive to extract if, if the cost of oil, which is the standard to be, is going to be less than $60 a barrel. Well, the Canadians aren't worried. They're going to make money. Now the thing about shale that's so interesting, and it's global, keep in mind it's global, is that the technology to produce it, remember back in the, in the discussion of what the factors were, the technology was invented in Texas in 1949. And what it amounts to is shooting water and a mixture of sand and chemicals into the rock at such high speeds that it cracks the rock, allowing the, the uh, oil and natural gas uh, to flow up. 
And what's happened since 1949 is we got better. The more expensive oil became, conventional oil became, the more desirable, the more incentive there was to develop the technology that would make it possible to extract natural uh, gas and oil from the shale and get it onto the marketplace. That you're trying to beat that, uh, that standard of conventional oil. What makes it so special? Precision. Today you can, it would, you can with one, one drill, spread out underground with um, a series of flanges to precision within 12 inches. So now you're not talking about guesswork. You're talking about known deposits that you can release, both oil and gas. That's powerful, powerful stuff. The United States um, has the world's largest uh, repository of coal. And um, when I asked the staff, I said, well, you know, what does that mean, really? And they said, we have enough coal for, to, to fuel for forever. Yeah, what does that mean? What does that mean? 300 years. Oh, well, that's pretty good. 300 years worth of coal. Of course, coal's very dirty. Tell me about shale. And the deposits of shale in the United States, the most conservative estimates are we have 600 years worth of shale. That's powerful. That's why it's called the game changer. That's why it's called shale gale. Now, where else is there shale? There's shale deep in the Gobi Desert of China. They don't have the technology. They would love to have it. They'd be happy to steal it from us. This involves a whole new arena of potential cooperation, a whole new chip in international relations. India has, uh, has some shale, but um, it's apparently uh, not, not very likely to produce as much. There's shale in Europe, huge deposits in France. It just so happens that their deposit is directly beneath the Palace Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> now you and I would take that sucker apart by brick and move it. <laughs> but we're not French. <laughs> so the French have announced that they're deeply concerned about the um, environmental impact of the use of shale, and they're going to stick with nuclear because it's safer. <laughs> <laughs> now, what this has meant is that we are increasingly able to meet more of our own growing demands with our own resources. And this means we are, in fact, importing less. It means that we are able, even the United States, able to actually export energy. That's a powerful change in the United States. We haven't been able to do that in 18 years. We're not exporting a lot, but compared to, you know, 89 million barrels a day, it's a start. Downside? You betcha there are downsides. Where are they? In the environment. People are very worried about the health of water table, uh, water safety. Yeah. So if you take the wastewater that you have injected in the ground, you extract it, you get it all back. But it's now got toxic. You put the minerals in it. Where do you put it? And if you find a place to put it, will it stay there? Or does it rise, does it float, does it move? We're not so sure. What happens when you inject under high pressure water into rock? You create seismic events. So people are very worried about the downside. Now the opportunity for shale is huge. 600 years, we could, we could save the planet. But we have to solve the environmental issues. We don't want to pretend that they don't exist. We need to be brutal and unforgiving in our analysis. We've got a problem, identify it, and fix it. That's what we do. We do it right, we can save the planet. We do it wrong, we're toast by the end of the century. <laughs> but, you know, there we are. 
But you have to admit there are people that feel, let's do it now and worry about problems later. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And there are other people who say, oh my God, we don't know what we're dealing with. Don't do anything. Right? We're going to go work on algae. And with this Congress, you're not going to come to any type of sort of agreement. Oh, no, no, no. If, if you're going to depend on Congress, uh, it's a whole different discussion. <laughs> okay. Third factor in this three-pronged approach, invest in innovation and technology. The fact of the matter is, this planet did not come out of the Stone Age because we ran out of rock. Technology made it possible to access other commodities, other natural resources, which changed the way we use energy, the way we distribute it, the way world markets operate. In the 1970s, the United States produced the majority of all engineers in the world. Last year, China produced 600,000 engineers, India produced 300,000 engineers, and the United States produced 70,000 engineers. What we need to do, and it's painful, we need to examine our educational and technological priorities and needs and address them with alacrity, with funding, with support, with primacy. We have a growing skills gap in this country, so even where you have pockets of available jobs, we don't have the people who can fill those jobs. We have to address these, uh, these needs. And that gets to that element I, I asked you to keep in mind uh, at the beginning, and that's the element of time. I was, in, um, I was in Alberta, I was in Canada, and I was getting a tour of the Canadian oil sands. Uh, and uh, the fellow who was showing me around was the manager of the, of the field there, and I said, what, what wakes you up at night? What worries you more than anything? And he thought about it, and he said, I'm 54 years old. I said, I understand. He said, no, no. I'm 54 years old, my deputy, good man, smart, well-educated, he's in his 30s. He hasn't had enough life experience. He hasn't had enough crises. He hasn't lived through enough things going wrong that the next time something happens, he can say, oh, I know what this is, here's how we address it. He's smart. He's well-educated. He just has a learning curve. And guess where we are as our baby boomers are retiring? We have a skills gap and a learning curve. This gets to the element of time. This is a classic example of why nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Some things take time. No matter what you do, it still takes 20 years to grow a teacher. No matter what you do, it still takes 35 years to grow a project manager. No matter what you do, it still takes 45 years to grow a leader. And we all know some leaders never get that wisdom thing. Yeah. Time. The element of time. So we have to operate as we recognize what's going to happen over the next 20 years. Growth in demand. Growth in a development, and that's the good part. Remember, development good, and that means we've got to be able to meet with uh, with available supplies for that demand. The United States has made energy transitions before. It's not like this is unheard of. In the early uh, in the early days of our country, we had dams, we had windmills, we burned wood from forests. It was only in the 1800s that we moved to coal. And it's only in the 20th century that we moved to oil. When Woodrow Wilson had his inaugural parade out there on Pennsylvania Avenue, he was in a horse-drawn carriage. That's less than 100 years ago. The challenges of the future play to the strengths of our past. 
This is what we do. We make these transitions. We lead in innovation. And we make it possible for the rest of the world to do so as well. We want the rest of the world, we need the rest of the world to grow, to develop. That's good for everybody. If we can supply, if we can help the world supply those energy needs to facilitate that kind of growth, we have done an incredible service to future generations. Foreign policy implications. The top five oil producing countries in the world are Saudi Arabia, Russia, the United States, China, and Iran. How we manage these relationships is critical on many, many fronts. And irresponsible rhetoric is very costly. So the challenges of meeting um, uh, a, a global need with a global response requires that we work to promote dialogue pro between producers and consumers, that we advance international cooperation, that we promote global trade, global commerce, global exchange, that we share research and development in the technologies in a way that can benefit the entire planet. If there's only one thought to take away from our discussion, it is that resource conflicts are not inevitable. We do not have to go to war over resources. We have alternatives. We have, in fact, 20 good years ahead of us. Let us use them wisely. I've overtalked my time, uh, so I think we're, it's your turn uh, to have questions and comment. Uh, let's, uh, yes, sir. What I'm hearing you say is that America, for, for the long-term global view, we should start opening up our opportunities in America to really get all the oil out of here is one of the problems. Is that, that would include also allowing Canada to send this stuff down through the pipeline. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Keystone is an example of a bad policy decision. Uh, we can spend some time on it, but it would be embarrassing and, and, uh, and awkward. Uh, but yes, sir, we should we should want that oil. Um, Even though that oil is going to be sent to China's island. That oil now may be sent to China, uh, but oil in Canada wants to come south for a whole a host of reasons. And we should, we should, uh, we have a chance to have another bite at the decision apple on that. And I seriously hope that we uh, correct course and, and do so. Um, but the, uh, by talking about shale and sands and, and, and the like, uh, it's not just about drilling to get at the prodigious uh, resources that we now have, but I am talking about the universe that we didn't talk about, the alternative fuels, the soil, the, the solar, the wind, the algae, and all that stuff, which is huge. Uh, we, need to, we need to diversify uh, so that we are not feeling vulnerable. Uh, but how, do I know what, how do I know what information to trust? Whenever I hear on the one hand, of course, we need all this, and on the other hand, I hear, well, if we keep pulling the shale out of the ground, what used to be one, one uh, earthquake, now we have 200 of them happening in the same area mm -hmm. because of the direct uh, change mm -hmm. of the uh, formation of the rocks. Right. There, there is a real risk uh, there, and the English Geological Survey has, uh, at, uh, at uh, the U.S. government direction, uh, produced um, a whole unit now to study seismic activity in the United States as it re relates to or may relate to uh, the seismic impacts of uh, fracking, uh, the fracturing technology that uh, allows us to, to get at the shale. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey produces that stuff. It's, it's all downloadable. If, if you want, we can go over a couple of the websites that I use to, to draw on, on, uh, on my materials. 
Um, but the, um, uh, the bottom line policy analytical conclusion from that is uh, that it, while it may be that we're a little ahead of ourselves, we seem to be okay. The number, right, I'm talking too much. Um, uh, the number one concern uh, the, uh, is how, how to make available uh, that information so that industry can correct. Uh, on, on water treatment, for example, GE has just announced that it can reclaim fracking wastewater. If that's really true, yay. I was in uh, West Texas talking to uh, some cattle ranchers who also happen to have prodigious shale deposits. Um, and they said, look, we're cattle ranchers. I'm willing to have the shale develop, but I need to know that the water is good for my cattle. That, to me, is the American story. If they insist on having clean water for their cattle, then somebody's going to figure out how to solve that problem. Uh, so I, I think it is, it is fair to say there are real um, environmental concerns, there are real geological concerns, um, but it is also, um, in its own perverse way, comforting to know that they are being addressed. Because if we don't do it right, we're toast. Absolutely, that's nature's whimsy. That's that third factor or fourth factor or whatever. That's right, we've got hurricane season hitting us as we speak. Yes, sir. Atomic and nuclear energy. Nuclear energy. Yes. Nuclear energy uh, has been a component in all projections for the future. All projections. The only way people have uh, imagined that we could, as a planet, meet our growing demand, our growing need for more energy in a, um, an environmentally responsible way would be to have a growing, a, a substantial and growing component for nuclear energy. That's a real issue. Uh, the two big problems with nuclear is what do you do about the waste and what do you do about potential weapons grade uh, plutonium as a byproduct. There are technologies uh, for the latter. We've screwed ourselves over on the Yucca Mountain uh, depository uh, for, for the waste. But mainly, what's, what sh shook the whole planet's interest in nuclear energy was Fukushima. An earthquake, uh, earthquake causing a tsunami, causing an overflow of the cooling system. It wasn't the plant, it was the cooling system for the Fukushima plant. And that threw everybody off. And everybody is taking a step back. They're scared. Um, but uh, for long-term future needs, we have to include nuclear, and the trick will be, the challenge to us all will be, make it safe. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Um, if 30% uh, of the oil that is imported um, is used for vehicular traffic... 70? I'm sorry, 70%. Um, this is what, what the number that you gave us. Um, now, wouldn't it make sense that we, we should not be held hostage to uh, the car industry and, and develop uh, the type of transportation that, uh, that there are many countries uh, in Europe have, and Japan, and, and, uh, and rather than start, uh, restart the manufacturing of cars uh, in, uh, in defunct uh, plants, uh, that, uh, that those be repurposed uh, for uh, re, uh, restarting uh, the rail uh, uh, company, restarting rail uh, traffic. Yes. Uh, and uh, why, isn't, why isn't there any discussion about that at all? Uh, there is a lot of discussion. There is a lot of discussion about it. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, coming off the traditional car dependence uh, that our uh, economy and the West in general, um, and rapidly now also the East, um, adopting is, is, a, is a big deal. But the infrastructure is a real issue. We've got now clean, uh, you see these signs saying this bus runs on clean natural gas. It's not quite true, but it's cleaner. Um, but the problem is, you're on the highway. You're on the Jersey Turnpike. 
You're driving along. Where are you going to pull over to fill up on your natural gas? We today have um, the technology for all electric cars, right? Where are you going to pull over while you're driving to plug in and recharge your battery for eight hours? The infrastructure and the way humans interact with the car is a continuing uh, conundrum for, for not just our society, but especially our society. Um, and switching technologies, while desirable, you're right. The fact of the matter, of, well, for example, the Prius, which is a dual engine car, right? It's both electric and gasoline. Prius has been on the market in the United States for 10 years. It is less than 1% of our national fleet. Less than 1% in after 10 years. It takes roughly 27 years for a new technology to switch over. That's not good. It's not bad. It just takes time. No, but this country was built on, on, on rail. That's how it started. Right. Yeah, the industrial harbor started in the 1800s with, with uh, the rail companies. Now, right. what would it take to... Uh, you know, to relegate the automobile industry to China or whoever can make cars cheaper and let them deal with that. Well, actually, it turns out we make, we make them cheaper. There are more, there's more manufacturing coming back to the well, United States. Well, whatever. But anyway, what would it take to... Well, okay, now, the train trains run on. They have to run on something, too. But surely they're far more efficient than, than this... Uh, well, uh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if you could go to your house from school on a train. If there were enough of them, if there was enough of them, there would be enough. Yep. <laughs> you hear that 27 years start? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but if you never start, then you never get it. That's it. We're well, but there, are, there, are efforts, there are efforts now to develop it. Um, right now, we're doing more with rail uh, uh, traffic that is not just car. Um, people still seem to want to fly, though. Thank you.